So that's just a reminder, we are in the book of Nahum, and we're starting chapter 1, verse 1, page 937. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up, He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look. There on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob, like the splendor of Israel, though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. This is the word of the Lord's. Thanks be to God. My name is Harry. I'm the curate here at Holy Trinity Church, and welcome, particularly if it's your first time this morning. Um, Let me just pray for us. Let's not let's admit this is a difficult text. Let us pray for ourselves that the Lord will work. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to the book of Nahum, it's a book you have given for us and for us to learn of you. Lord, I pray as we we listen from your word this morning, you would teach us, teach us to see you are the God that is good, mighty and just. Amen. Just before we uh, begin really getting into the text, I think it's important to set the scene when we look at a new uh, book of Scripture, uh, and, and we know that Nahum is written somewhere between 663 BC and 612 BC. Uh, and, and we can know that because the text itself actually helps us. So in Nahum 3, verses 8 to 10, we hear of the falling of Thebes, which is like a city in Egypt. And we know historically that happened in 663 BC. Uh, but we also know that the city of Nineveh that is being prophesied against in this text. Uh, was destroyed in 612 BC. 
That tells us the, that Nahum is writing somewhere between those two points. And yet we know it's probably not too close to 612 BC, because in chapter 1, verse 12, we're told that Nineveh has many allies and are numerous. Uh, so Nineveh, as the capital city of Assyria, this is a time when they are strong still. It's not leading towards the decline at 612 BC. It was a rapid decline, but we're not there yet. We don't know much about Nahum, the Elkishite, apart from he's called Nahum and he's from Elkishite, uh, because he's not mentioned anywhere else. And we, need to, we just listened to Jonah, didn't we? And that spoke of Nineveh. If you were here, we learned about how Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And Nahum is kind of set 100 years later. And here we see that although Nineveh may have repented in the past, they have returned to their evil ways. And so they are, they are facing God's judgment and destruction. Now, to maybe get a little bit of a flavor of what Nineveh was like, um, we might think a little bit more broadly about, in general, what was the Assyrian Empire like? Assyria uh, was the, uh, the empire, Nineveh the, the main city. Well, a historian, Tom Holland, uh, pictured Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, roughly the Middle East, where Assyria was, um, as a bottle. So imagine you're living there and you're in this bottle. And then he described Assyria as placing a hornet in the bottle. Now, I googled what a hornet was, and it is a giant wasp. They look pretty terrifying. So, you can, so the idea is, he's trying to get this picture that Assyria were an imperialistic and destructive empire, conquering much of the area. And Nineveh was kind of their HQ. And so we're told that Nineveh are evil, that the Lord has declared them evil. But then as we, as we get with the context of where Nahum's writing, what's going on around the time of Nahum, perhaps this question pops into my head. What do we do with Nahum? It's hard, isn't it? I think actually it's harder in some respects. I think this is probably the easier section of the three sermons I have. It's hard. It's a book of God's judgment, his wrath. Now, we mustn't imagine God is an out-of-control maniac. His wrath and judgment are his right, settled, controlled hostility to all that is evil. But as we read Nahum, I'm sure we might be thinking, why on earth are we preaching on Nahum? Why don't we just skip over it, downplay it, skip to the New Testament? And yet, if we believe the Bible is given to us by the Lord, if we believe the Holy Spirit has specifically preserved Scripture for us in this way, then Nahum is not here by accident. It wasn't slipped in by someone who wasn't very nice. It was given to us by the Lord, the same Lord of of the whole of the scriptures. So we cannot ignore it. Because if we do, we miss something of what the Lord has given us to teach us as followers of him, of how to follow him faithfully. Nahum really presents, in all its pictures and imagery, God's character at its fullest. doesn't deny one aspect, but presents him as he is, clearly. And that includes his judgment and wrath. Now we've called this whole term costly discipleship. And I know you're wondering what on earth has Nahum got to do with following Jesus. Um, but it does give us, it is costly to look at Nahum. It's costly to look at Nahum because it's a cost to let go of our pride. We might long as the creature to say to the creator, God, this shouldn't be in the Bible. Let's just rip it out. God, you should deal with evil differently. God, I want you to be like what I want and agree with everything I say. God, I want to make you up as I want you to be. Perhaps the cost of Nahum, what it reminds us of so deeply, is that I am the creature and God is the creator. God is God and I am not. And I must come on my knees and still trust him. So I think our challenge is that to let this book be our corrective. To make sure we rightly behold our God, we sang at the start, that we understand him fully. That we don't upplay some characteristics and downplay others. That we rightly understand who our God is. And we fall on our knees and worship him as he is.
Because surely, if our world said it's, it says it's my right to define who I am, we must give God the right to define who he is. And as he is our creator, we are the creatures. Let us humble ourselves before him and trust him. This will not be easy. This, as I prepped this text, it was not easy. It's not been easy for me to read this book quite regularly the last few weeks. It's a hard book. But that's what I've come to the conclusion, that I need to fall on my knees before the scriptures that are given and trust that it is telling me what God is actually like. To repent of where I have made God out to be something I want him to be and not listen to his word that tells me what he actually is like. To seek truth and who he really is. Let's do that now as as we behold our God who is mighty and just, verse 1 to 8. Verse 2 to 3 captures, don't they? The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. He is a God who takes evil seriously. He is a God who will not let those that oppose him get away with it. His wrath, as I said, is not him being out of control, but his right, settled, controlled hostility to all that is evil. And of course, if we say that God is good, we wouldn't want a good God to just ignore evil. That wouldn't be someone who's good. That's someone who's either unpowerful, they can't deal with evil, or someone who's corrupt, who's happy to sweep evil under the rug. Someone is good, they would care about right and wrong. And if they are powerful, they should do something about it. And our Lord shows us he he is good and he is mighty. He is just. But there's also verse 3. And you may say straight away, Harry, it sounds like a contradiction. You said he takes his wrath out on his enemies, but he's slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. But it is true, he... Nineveh repented. He sent Jonah. They had a hundred years. Is he not patient with us too? That he does not treat us as our sins deserve. I indeed sent the Lord Jesus to die. He is patient. He is slow to anger. He will not let evil win and justice will be done. But he is willing to give us all a chance to repent. We also see his might and his power that he's he's totally unlike us in who he is. And that's a good thing. I wouldn't want a God that is like a human being because he wouldn't be a very powerful God. But you hear that greatness. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. In RE we would say he's transcendent, he's above us. But it's not just that he's above us, he is unlike us. He is the Almighty. Read verse 4 and 5. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Have you ever tried to speak to the sea? Has it ever listened to you? Don't we treat the sea rightly with respect? We swim when it's safe. We've seen the might of waves, the power of the wind. And yet, as we read verse 4, we find that the Lord can dry up the sea and the rivers run dry. He is not a kind of superhuman. He is mighty beyond our comprehension. Verse 4 would have reminded the Old Testament readers of the Exodus where he parted the Red Sea. The Lord is mighty. Bashan and Carmel are places that would have been agriculturally fertile lands. Yet they will wither before the Lord Almighty. Lebanon, a place that trees and wood were widely sought after in the ancient Near East. It will fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. The Lord is mighty. Who can stand against him? Indeed, not even the might of mountains, the creation itself cannot stand against the Lord Almighty. He is mighty in a way that we almost cannot comprehend. And yet, we have verse 6 and 7 side by side. Who can withstand his indignation, this conclusion of his might and power? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and rocks are shattered before him. 
And yet, verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. It almost appears contradictory, doesn't it? How can the Lord be good and yet his wrath be described so powerfully, so brutally almost? Well, it is because he is good that he will not tolerate evil. It's because he is good that justice will be done. And he offers us refuge. We'll see that when we look to Christ shortly. The perfectly good God can never stand for evil. There is no escaping his justice, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. The Lord is mighty and just. No one would escape the Lord's justice. Nineveh, this great city, power in Assyria, Duda, a minnow, a tiny fish, compared to the might of Nineveh and Assyria. Nineveh will not escape. The Lord will judge them for their evil. So we must behold our God who is mighty and just, unlike us, but good, who will not allow evil to stand. And then behold our God, the second part. Behold our God who saves through destroying evil. Behold our God who saves through destroying evil. As you read verse 9 to 2, 2, there's kind of two parallel pictures that come across. Nineveh and the evil they are being unable to escape. But that the destruction of evil is good news for God's people. It's good news for the town of Judah. Verse 9 and 10 I pick up on this first point that Nineveh, the evil city, cannot escape. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk with, from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. So verse 9 to 11, that, that sense of, of their planning, their plotting, the hope to escape, but they will not. They will drink, verse 10, the cup of God's wrath. They will be consumed. Their evil plans and wickedness against the Lord, they will not get away. Their plans will not triumph. Those plans they make in verse 11, we read in verse 12, this is what the Lord says, although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Although they are big, they are mighty, they are strong. Nineveh will not stand. Evil will not be able to stand against the Lord. They will be broken. And in doing so, Judah will be set free from their oppression that they've brought on them. They will enjoy freedom from being oppressed by this nation. Verse 13 and 14 again. The destruction frees God's people. They... Now break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. God's judgment. The one who knows all and sees all, how can it not be just? The one who is good and longs to destroy evil, how can it not be right? And it's hard to see that the Lord will do this. But he is a God who is good, who cannot tolerate evil. In doing so, he, he, as he wipes out Nineveh totally, do we read in verse 15, this is good news? Look, they're on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. God's people will one day rejoice. In, in, in Judah, where they'll be rejoicing because they'll be free to celebrate again. As evil is destroyed around them, so they'll be free to worship the Lord. They'll no longer be burdened by Nineveh, but once more able to rejoice. As evil is defeated, their peace is brought for them. And finally, 2 1 and 2. Again, this contrast Nineveh cannot escape, Judah rejoices. Verse 1 of chapter 2 An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? It's like it's almost a taunt. Do you think you could stand, Nineveh? 
Go on, give it your best shot. Could you stand against the Lord Almighty? It's, it's pointless, isn't it? Foolish for Nineveh. We just read about the, what the Lord is like, how his might is beyond anything human beings could muster. Nineveh will not stand. It, it almost feels like a fool's errand for Nineveh to even listen to that call. Verse 2, though, again, because of the defeat of evil, the Lord's people rejoice. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Their destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. Judah will be restored. God's people will be able to again be splendid in the sight. They will have an opportunity to celebrate, to rejoice, to carry out their festivals because evil has been defeated. God has saved his people through the judgment of evil. God has, has saved through destroying evil. And I know this is not easy as we read this, but, but ultimately and finally, this is what the cross of Christ is all about. At, at the cross of Christ, we see both judgment and mercy together. It is where justice and mercy meet. Because if the Lord is to be good, if the Lord is to love truth and hate falsehood, if he's to be good and hate evil, then he cannot let it kind of just be swept under the, under the rug. We wouldn't call a judge who doesn't enact any justice a good judge. We'd probably call him corrupt. And so, on the cross, the punishment does fall. Evil cannot be ignored or left undealt with. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, willingly went to the cross to pay a price we should pay. If you had to ask me where would I be in the book of Nahum, as a sinner deserving of God's judgment, I would find myself in the company of Nineveh. As, I'm a rebellion, as I rebel against the Lord, that is right. And yet, and yet, because the Lord Jesus willingly died for our sins, endured the moment of greatest agony, and that was not the physical suffering of dying on, in the most horrific manner, in one of the worst forms of execution human beings created, it was not the physical pain of the cross that was agony for Jesus, although it would have been, obviously. The moment of greatest agony when Christ was forsaken by his heavenly Father, when he drank the cup of God's wrath, willingly, obediently, because he longed for people to be set free and saved. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the moment of greatest agony. As for that brief moment, the Son of God was forsaken by his Father. But it was done so that as he died, defeated death, rose again, there is a place where rebels and sinners, people deserving of God's wrath, may find forgiveness. That is the undeserved kindness, that is grace from our Lord. It was given to us, not cheaply, for it cost the Son of God his life. But the one who is just and good, who will not let evil stand, made sure that the price was paid. That in Christ, hidden in him, we find our refuge. We find the one who saves us, who sets us free. It means we have forgiveness. What, what do we do with Nahum? What do we do now? As we behold the good, just, and mighty God, what do we do? Well, in some respect, the answer is nothing. Nahum, if you, if, if you noticed in Nahum, there's no call to any one of God's people. Nahum doesn't tell them to buck up their ideas, pick up a spear. He doesn't say any of that. It is the Lord who acts, the Lord who is just. And so it's not our fight to go out like that. We do have a fight. Ephesians 6 tells us we have a fight, but it's against not against flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual call to stand firm in the face of temptation and the devil. Might we feel uncomfortable as we read Nahum? I think it's understandable. I have felt uncomfortable all week and will do for the next two weeks as I continue to prep Nahum. And, and in some respects, if you feel uncomfortable, that might be a sign that you need to turn to Christ if you haven't already. 
Because if we're living in sin, if we live in rebellion against the Lord and have not turned to Christ in repentance and faith, God will judge through Christ's return. When he comes again, Revelation 19, 11 to 16 tells us he will come on a horse with a sword to finally put an end to evil and all rebellion against the Lord. The greatest evil is ignoring our creator. But we find refuge in Christ, in him, as the Lord has given us time to repent, to come to him. But perhaps the most outrageous way we should respond to Nahum, but perhaps what the, the pastor is trying to do is that we should feel comforted that God is like this. I know, it sounds outrageous, doesn't it? How can I say that? Well, justice will be done. Now, we are called, and we are, Romans tells us that we have systems of justice in place which we can, we can use. But I'm sure in a moment's thought, we can think of injustice, where the system has failed, where someone has died at a good old age, and their heinous crimes are only revealed years later. Where we've been let down. And if there's no justice afterwards, then that is the way of the world. A place where people get away with evil every day, where nothing will be made right. But because the Lord is good, because the Lord loves truth, because he is mighty and powerful, the price will be paid. Justice will be done. Either it's paid for by Christ as the person finds forgiveness in him, or the person will face the wrath of God. Justice will be done. No one will get away with evil. But there's also no need to take revenge. Now, we seek justice in the systems we have, rightly so. But when they fail us, we don't need to despair and take the law into our own hands, so to speak, to seek vengeance. The Lord will repay what is owed to everyone. The Lord is just and will right every wrong. The price will be paid, the punishment will be enacted. Evil will not win. And that's the other comfort, that evil, evil does not win. If this world is all there is, if, if this is it, then we live in a world that is forever marred by evil. The last century, um, eventually most of the conflicts were secular, started. One of the most destructive centuries in human history. The thought that somehow we have progressed to a stage where we can live in a utopia on earth, surely is a fool's game. Or we seem incapable of not messing it up. But in Christ, through faith in him and the justice and judgment of God, evil will not win. The new creation will be good. And there will be no back door where evil kind of sneaks in to spoil it again. God is mighty. His judgment is final. And so my final uh, plea for us, what I've sort of been drawn to as I've read Nahum is, I need to worship the Lord with reverence and fear. I'm once again reminded I am the creature and God is the creator. Who am I to say to the one who is ultimately good, the ways you've chosen are not right? Who am I to say to the one who is true, you speak lies? Should I dare stand before him and think I am right and he is not? Well, if we believe that God is good, is true, then surely that is a a monumental mistake on our part. If verse 7 is true, the Lord is good. If it's true that he will act in justice, we believe that the Lord's word is true. We must humble ourselves before it. I obey the Lord because he is good, just, and truthful, and I am not. And I must repent of the times when I have put God in a box, where I have forgotten what he's like, where I have diminished his greatness, his justice, his goodness, his mightiness, his awesomeness, his love, and his mercy, where I have let him be defined by me and not let him define who he is. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a confession.
Uh, and as we confess our sins, I'd, I'd encourage you perhaps to ponder that thought. Have I, made, have I reduced God? Have I made him small? Have I made him just to be another, a, a, a human that's kind of like Superman? And if we have, let us repent and ask God to help us see him in his majesty. Let me pray and then we'll say a confession together. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you are the just God who will not let evil win, who does not let uh, the guilty go unpunished, but who is slow to anger, who is abounding in love and grace, who has, in Christ, given us a refuge that both satisfies justice, the price is paid, but can offer mercy and grace and forgiveness. Lord, if we have, if we have hidden in Christ, thank you. We did not deserve it, but you were gracious enough to save us. Lord, I pray that we would not limit you, Lord. That we would see you as you are, worship you as the great, good, mighty and just God. That although we may struggle with a book like Nahum, we would humbly let it correct our thoughts. That we would allow you, God, to shape who you are to us and, not, and we would not make you in our own image. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. Amen.